listening to the recording. I welcome all of you who are listening to the recording who could not come on live with us. I thank you for those who are on live. There are many on live with us this morning by internet or by cell phone. This is Pastor Leroy Carter, pastor of the Back to Basics Online Church, where Jesus Christ is Lord of all, where Jesus Christ is moving mightily. He's moving in my life. He's moving in your life. He's got great things for each and every one of you. And so we just thank God that you took the time out to come and worship with your church family today. I have a great message for you today. It's going to bless you. It's going to bless a lot of people. My message today is entitled, The Dangers of Not Attending Church. I'm going to be preaching about the dangers of not attending church. And if you think this is something, next week I'm going to be preaching about the dangers of attending church. Well, you say, well, that's that's a dichotomy. That's a counterproductive. No, no, just follow me. Today we're going to look at the dangers of not attending church. Then we're going to look next week at the dangers of attending church. And when you put this whole thing together, you're going to be blessed. God is going to bless you. And so we welcome you. Give a shout out to all of you today. And we're going to ask our friend, Ryan Trogler. Ryan, would you come on and lead us in prayer today? Uh, Good morning, Pastor. Good morning, everybody. Uh, Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for making another beautiful day. We want to thank you for breathing the breath of life into us once again today. And we want to thank you for dying on the cross and shedding your blood for all of our sins. And we want to thank you for providing all of our needs. And we also, Lord, want to thank you for giving Pastor Carter the knowledge and the wisdom to teach us your word again today. And we just want to bless everybody today and make sure everybody has an awesome day. And just come down here and make make the blind see, the deaf hear. Show us, you know, show us your miracles and what you can do for those people who don't believe and make them believe. Lord, we just want to say thank you. We honor you, love you, and praise you, glorify you. In Jesus Christ's precious name, amen. Amen, amen. Thank you, Ryan. That was Ryan Trogler, brothers and sisters, our brother from uh, Marysville, Pennsylvania. Praise God. Thank you, Ryan. And we give a shout out to you and your precious wife, Tara, and your daughter, Jenna. And uh, may God continue to bless each and every one of you. I see Colorado's in the house, Jeep's in the house. I see Jackie Fisher's in the house, Kentucky's in the house. I see Texas is in the house, Zizzo's there. I see uh, even we've got uh, Idaho in the house, Christy Carpenter. I see Wes and uh, Marisol in the, in the house, New Jersey's in the house. Praise God for this nationwide worldwide ministry and a lot of people connect with us by way of the video worldwide we have a worldwide audience we're not into counting numbers or counting heads we just want you to be blessed by the lord we want you to grow in christ jesus and that's the purpose for this ministry to preach the word of god so that god's people can grow that sinners can come into salvation and it's a teaching ministry Uh, preaching teaching ministry where we just present the word of God so that you can grow Uh, so many believers are not growing but we know that in this ministry you're growing because the Lord is giving us uh, uh, food for growth every Sunday we're getting food for growth and so uh, we just want to thank you and bless you and praise you on behalf of my wife Jackie and I we welcome you to the online church and Jackie's doing her part helping the, the, the uh, brick and mortar church to grow as she does every Sunday morning. And uh, then we get together and she reviews the, uh, the message. Sometimes she sits in her, in her church and watches, watches us live. And uh, so we partner together in order to help you to grow in Christ Jesus. Well, the Lord <coughs> has uh, blessed me again with a message. And a two-part series. One is this week, The Dangers of Not Attending Church. I want you to listen carefully to this message today and so that you can uh, make sure you're not violating any of these things and encourage others. What you get, 
You ought to encourage others with it. We're going to look at the dangers of not attending church. And then next week, I mean, it, might, it might sound funny, but we're going to look at the dangers <clears throat> of attending church. And then when you wrap this whole thing together, you're going to be even more blessed that you, you're a part of this online church and what God is doing in the online church. And we thank God. We praise God. Uh, let's, I want to take a look at, um, I'm going to give you seven, uh, seven, well, actually I have 13 dangers of not attending church. We're not going to highlight all of them today, but uh, uh, I may mention them, but we may, we'll not have time to highlight each and every one. Um, but before we get into that, I want to read Hebrews from Hebrews chapter 10. Would you turn in your Bible or download Hebrews 10? And we're going to start reading at verse 22. Hebrews 10, verse 22. We're going to read, we're going to read the remaining of that chapter from 22 to 39. Praise God. Praise God. I feel fired up today. I feel excited about what God is doing in my life. Jackie Fisher, I feel excited about what God is doing in your life. Christy Carpenter, I feel excited about what God is doing up in Idaho and Zisla down in Texas and every one of you. Uh, Terry up in, out in Loveland, Colorado, I thank God for what God is doing in our lives. And I may not call all, all of your names and you say, well, you always call somebody's name certain people. You never mention mine. Well, um, that's because I don't see you in the window, but I give a shout out to you. Okay, Hebrews chapter 10, verse, starting with verse 22, and we welcome David Carter from Dubai, um, David and his Carter, um, David and his family, David Carter and Nyoka, all the way from Dubai, the nation of Dubai. We have David speak to us a little bit later on. Hebrews Chapter 10, starting with verse 22. Please listen to the word or follow me as I read. I'm reading from the King James Version. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. This is a very important verse for our message today. Verse 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. For if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Verse 29, of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despot unto the Spirit of grace. For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me. I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. Verse 31, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Remember that it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. But call to remembrance the former days. Go back to when you first got saved, in which after you were illuminated, you endured a great flight of afflictions partly while you were made a gazing stock, both to reproaches and afflictions, and partly while you became companions of them that were so used. 
So go back to the time when you first got saved, when people teased you. They made fun of you. Uh, they, they humiliated you as, as you began to associate with believers. Verse 34, for ye had compassion of, of, of me in my bonds. This is Paul writing. He said, for you had compassion of me in my bonds and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods, knowing in yourselves that ye have in heaven a better and an enduring substance. Cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. Verse 36, for ye have need of patience, that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come, and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith. Very important verse, verse 38. Now the just shall live by faith. But if, if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. This is God speaking through the Apostle Paul. Now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. In him. That's a warning to anyone who is tempted to backslide or wants to draw away from God, wants to quit the church, wants to quit serving God. Now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. Jesus said, my soul will have no pleasure in any who turn back. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. You and I, brothers and sisters, church family, we're among those who are not going to draw back. We do not believe in drawing back. No matter how, to, no matter how difficult things become, we're not going to draw back, but we're going to believe to the saving of the soul. And this verse lets us know that salvation is a continuous process. Oh, what? What? What are you saying, Pastor? I'm saying the Bible says, but we are not unto them who draw back unto perdition but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Salvation is the process of believing God to the saving of the soul. In other, in other words, from the moment you give your heart to Jesus, you're going to stay committed to believing God and obeying God until, until Jesus comes back for you, until either you die or Jesus comes back for you, uh, uh, and catches you up in the rapture. That means we are to be committed to the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a continuous process. Last week we talked about uh, can a Christian lose their salvation. In fact, the last three weeks we talked about can a Christian lose their salvation. Many Christians have lost their salvation because they turned back. The first problem they encountered after confessing Jesus, they turned back. They went back out into the world. The scripture warns us about going back. Ladies and gentlemen there, what can we turn back to? We were, we were bound for hell before we got saved. And now that we're saved, why go back into that, uh, get on that bus that's heading to hell, that train that's heading to hell, that plane that's heading to hell. So many people have turned back and we're living in an age of apostasy. Wake up, people. Tell people to wake up, church. Wake them up. What is there to go back to? We were all in sin until we came into the knowledge of Jesus Christ. When the Holy Spirit enlightened us about Jesus Christ and we confessed him as Lord and we promised, we made a pledge that we will follow him all the way. But that yet there are so many people who have turned back. They've turned back to the riches and the pleasures of this world. Some have turned back into homosexuality, lesbianism, money, greed, lying, corruption, uh, uh, political uh, 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 persuasions, and, and they have been corrupted by the cares of this world. But ladies and gentlemen, you and I, we cannot turn back. We must not turn back. I wonder, can I get a witness out there? We must not turn back because there is nothing to turn back to. God said in his word, now the just, meaning the saved, shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, 
My soul shall have no pleasure in them. God will have no pleasure in you, ladies and gentlemen, if you turn back. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them who that believe to the saving of the soul. We want to welcome you all to the Back to Basics online church. This message today is the dangers of not attending church. There are dangers, ladies and gentlemen, of not attending church. You may say, but you don't know what my church is like. You don't know what my church has become. There are dangers of not attending church. You don't have to keep attending that church, ladies and gentlemen. You can uh, find a church where you can grow. This online church is, is helping people to grow. There is no excuse, ladies and gentlemen, for anybody staying in a dead church trying to make things change. Look, if your church is dead and they don't want to hear you, why are you going to stay there and try to make them uh, believe? You can't make believers out of them. The Holy Ghost can't make believers out of them. If they have made up their minds, they don't want to believe. So why are you still attending there? Why are you still sitting there? Why aren't you trusting God for something better? I want to thank God for those of you who have the courage to attend the online church. People all over the world are realizing that the online church has an anointing. There's an anointing, Ryan Troger. The presence of God is here, and we're not better than anyone else. We are part of the whole church. We are connected to the brick-and-mortar church. We are part of the body of Christ. But there's an anointing. When, when God sees you taking a bold step, and you say, I'm going to get out of this corrupt fellowship. They don't have Jesus. They don't want Jesus. They don't want the Holy Ghost. I'm not going to sit up here anymore and take this. I'm going to seek the Lord for what he has for me. And many of you are seeking the Lord. And, and this online church is temporary for a lot of you. It's temporary so that God can get your attention, fill you with the Holy Spirit, give you a vision. And some of you will start your own online church some of you will go back to the brick and mortar church and bring changes. Some of you will take some leadership positions in the brick and mortar church and help build men and women up. That's what this thing is all about. Praise God. Praise God. So I thank God for the online church. I thank God for you. Ladies and gentlemen, let's take a look at several. I'm going to just list several things that happen when you stop attending church. I'm going to list them there. We're going to highlight a few of them. Number one, you will miss out on God's primary purpose for your spiritual growth and well-being. You will miss out on God's primary purpose or God's primary design for your spiritual growth and well-being. Church is where God has designed for you to grow. And if you're not growing in your church, and, and before you make a decision, I'm going to stop going to church, you need to ask God to show you a church where you can go and grow. Go and grow. Go and grow, ladies and gentlemen. Number two, if you, if you stop attending church, you disobey God. Ladies and gentlemen, we've got a whole nation, almost a whole nation of people who are disobeying God disobeying God. Number three, you make a statement to the world that God is not worthy of worship. Listen to this. When you stop attending church, you're witnessing, you're testifying to the world that God is not worthy of your worship. We're going to highlight these things. Number four, when you uh, stop attending church, you cannot minister to anyone. No, it's not all about you, ladies and gentlemen. God has a lot of you going to church to help build somebody else up. Number five, when you stop attending church, you skip out on a foretaste of heaven. You miss, you just miss getting a foretaste, a little taste of what heaven is all about. And then I've got about, oh, maybe six or seven more uh, purposes. We're going to highlight at least the first five uh, today. But before that, uh, the Holy Spirit has brought to my attention uh, what many churches have, and that's the church covenant, the church covenant. And I'm going to read to you, I'm going to read to you the entire Baptist 
church covenant because I'm out of a Baptist background. I was ordained a Baptist minister, grew up in the Baptist church, and I've heard this covenant all my life. And, and whether you're Baptist or Methodist or out of Pentecostal or, or some uh, 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 Catholic persuasion, whatever, there is a church covenant. Every church, every denomination has a covenant. Well, what is a covenant? Ladies and gentlemen, the word covenant means marriage. Every church has a marriage agreement where men and women, boys and girls, they, 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 they make this statement and they confess their marriage to one another. Ladies and gentlemen, not only are we married to the Lord Jesus Christ, but we are married to one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. We are bound to one another. And so I'm just going to share with you just as an example, the Baptist church covenant, but your church covenant, may the wording may be different, but the covenant is it's an agreement. It's a marriage agreement that believers make with God. And ladies and gentlemen, we make this agreement with God and among ourselves with one another, and, and, and it's, it's, it's as strong as a marriage agreement. When a man and a woman get married, they take vows, they make a holy agreement before God in the presence of angels and the people who are assembled around them. You make uh, the, your marriage vows in the, in the presence of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And also your witnesses are the angels and the people who are around you. So let's take a look at the, the church covenant and see what many of us, uh, whether you know it or not, uh, you you were under the command of this covenant when you joined the church, when you associated with the church. So I want to remind you and remind myself of what we agreed to do. It's a reminder of our marital relationship with Jesus and our marriage relationship with one another. A covenant is so strong, it's just like a marriage relationship. Brothers and sisters in the church are, are, are connected to one another. So let's look at uh, what the Baptist Church Covenant says. I'm going to read it to you. Having been led as we believe. These are things that people recite once a month when they take the Lord's Supper, when they have communion. They recite this or read it out together. Having been led as we believe by the Spirit of God to receive the Lord Jesus as our Savior and on the profession of our faith, having been baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, we do now in the presence of God, angels, and this assembly most solemnly and joyfully enter into covenant with one another as one body in Christ. Ladies and gentlemen, the church covenant is stronger than the Mayflower Compact. It's stronger than agreeing to the Constitution of the United States. When church brothers and sisters covenant with one another, they covenant with God in the presence of God. It's a promise that we make to God and to one another. The covenant continues. We engage, therefore, by the aid of the Holy Spirit to walk together in Christian love, to strive for the advancement of this church in knowledge and holiness, to give it a place in our affections, prayers, and services above every organization of human origin to sustain its worship, ordinances, discipline, and doctrine to contribute cheerfully and regularly as God has prospered us towards its expenses for the support of a faithful and evangelical ministry among us, the relief of the poor, and the spread of the gospel throughout the world. These are things we pledge to do, ladies and gentlemen. In case of difference of opinion in the church, we will strive to avoid a contentious spirit. And if we cannot unanimously agree, we will cheerfully recognize the right of the majority to govern. The church covenant continues. We also engage to maintain family and secret devotion. Listen to this, ladies and gentlemen. This is something we pledge to do in the presence of God when we join the church. We also engage to maintain family and secret devotion 
to study diligently the word of God, to religiously educate our children, to seek the salvation of our kindred and acquaintance, to walk circumspectly in the world, to be kind and just to those in our employ, and faithful in the service we promise others, endeavoring in the purity of heart and goodwill towards all men to exemplify and commend our holy faith. The church covenant continues, we further engage to watch over, to pray for, to exhort, and stir up each other unto every good work and word and work to guard each other's reputation, not needlessly exposing the infirmities of others, to participate in each other's joys, and with tender sympathy bear one another's burdens and sorrows, to cultivate Christian courtesy, to be slow to give or take offense, but always ready for reconciliation, being mindful of the rules of the Savior in the 18th chapter of Matthew to secure it without delay. And through life, amid evil report and good report, to seek to live to the glory of God who hath called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. And then we end the church covenant with, when we remove from this place, meaning when you remove from First Baptist or Second Pentecostal or your local church, when you move somewhere else or when you, when you uh, disassociate yourself with this church, listen to this. When we remove from this place, we engage as soon as possible to unite with some other church. I'm going to read that again. When we remove from this church, from this place, we engage as soon as possible to unite with some other church where we can carry out the spirit of this covenant and the principles of God's word. Ladies and gentlemen, that is an example of a church covenant. Every church has a covenant. Every denomination has a covenant. These, the covenant is the agreement that we make with one another, with other members of the body of Christ. As we fellowship together, the covenant is a marriage agreement we make with our brothers and sisters in that church, and it's an agreement that we make with God, and in we make this in the presence of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and the angels and the people assembled around us. Now my question is, what has happened to the church covenant? Come on, somebody, talk to me. What has happened to the agreement that we have made before God? Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I, I, I even believe there are some of you right now listening who have forgotten all about the church covenant, the promises that we made. Uh, we, we swore before God. We made a, a, a testimony before God. We covenanted with God just as though we were taking marriage vows with one another that we would deport ourselves, carry ourselves, conduct ourselves in a certain manner, and, and, and should problems come or disagreements come, uh, we will seek for the edification of the church to the glory and honor of God. We will not put down one another. We will not denounce one another. We, not, we will not be haters. We will not leave talking about one another. But as soon as we leave, ladies and gentlemen, we have made a covenant before God that we will unite with some other church where we can carry out the principles of this covenant and the principles of God's word. Ladies and gentlemen, if you don't have a copy of the church covenant, I will get you a copy. I will send it to you. Send me an email. Uh, every denomination has a church covenant. Covenant. We're not under a denomination, ladies and gentlemen, but I have pledged myself to this covenant from the time I got saved. I pledged myself to this particular covenant that I shared with you. Uh, you may come from a different uh, uh, denominational background. You may not have a denominational background, but we have a covenant relationship with one another and a covenant relationship with God. I know Ryan is saying, wow, I didn't know that, Pastor Carter. I know Jeep is saying, wow, that's deep. I know Linda uh, uh, is saying, wow. I know Jackie Fisher is saying, wow, I didn't know that. 
Christy Carpenter said, whoa. And, 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 and Wes will say, yeah, Dad, I remember that. And, and so many of you, uh, and, I, and I know even in Dubai, I know David Carter said, yeah, I remember when we lived in McKinney, Texas, we were under the covenant. And so wherever you go, ladies and gentlemen, you are under a covenant relationship, not only with God, but a relationship with your brothers and sisters. And when you lose, when you leave the church, when you leave the church, whether it's voluntarily or involuntarily, whether you leave happily or whether you leave uh, in strife, you, you, uh, the, the fact that you leave, if you don't carry out these covenant relationships, you have sinned against God. Why? Because you made a promise. It's just like Israel on Mount Sinai. When Moses brought the people to Mount Sinai after God had delivered them from Egypt, the mountain shook, the mountain smoked, flames were coming forth from that, that mountain, and God spoke to the people, and they entered into a covenant relationship with God, ladies and gentlemen. God said, I will be your God, and God gave them the principles, the commandments to follow and obey, and they swore before God, we will keep this covenant. Well, ladies and gentlemen, when we received Jesus Christ as our Savior and Lord, we came into a covenant relationship with God and a covenant relationship with the church, the body of Christ. I wonder how many people have gotten away from that covenant relationship. We all need to repent. We all need to say, God, I'm sorry. God, I did not know. God, I did this ignorantly. God will forgive you if you will repent. Every one of us needs to repent from not walking in covenant relationship with God and for not walking into covenant relationship with our fellow believers. Well, Pastor Card, I didn't realize I was, I was getting into this when I when I uh, uh, came on into the online church. Well, the online church, we preach the word of God. We pre preach the unadulterated word of God. We preach holiness and righteousness. And if we have erred, we're going to sin. We're going to get back to God, get back to where we ought to be. God has named this ministry Back to Basics Ministries. We're getting back to the basics, back to the basic foundational principles of relationship with God the Father through Jesus Christ our Lord. And that is why for this entire year, we are teaching foundational principles to get God's people to open their eyes and to get back to where we ought to be in God. I could pronounce benediction right now, and there's enough for you to chew on. You get this uh, uh, copy of this, this message today and go over it. Get a copy of the church uh, uh, covenant and open your Bible and reread Hebrews 10, starting with 22 through 20, 39, and, and, and God will bless you. He will bless you. He will bless you. And when God opens your eyes and you say, wow, I didn't realize I was so far away from my covenant with God. I, I, I didn't realize that I had, have violated my brothers and sisters and the covenant I made with them. Then once you come into that realization, then repent. Repent. Say, God, I'm sorry. God, help me. Help me to renew my covenant relationship with you. Help me to renew my covenant relationship with the church. And if you have left the church, if you have left a church with animosity and bitterness in your heart, somebody hurt you, and if you're still uh, 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 letting that hurt fester, you need to repent. You need to forgive those people who hurt, who hurt you. Forgive them. You don't have to go back and worship with them, but forgive them. Don't let anything fester in you. Let no root of bitterness be in you, the Word of God says. Unless if we let a root of bitterness in us, stay in us, many people may be defiled. So God has shown us the way. There is a way of escape. You may not go back to the church you belong to. You may be happy with the online church. I love seeing you on the online church because I know what God has given me is blessing you. And I believe that what you get, you can bless someone else. But do not harbor bitterness in your heart. If you got bitterness against somebody, against some pastor, against somebody who hurt you back in your former church, and if you're not repenting, you are in error. And so forgive them 
and release them unto God. And then God can help you to grow, and you, and you can go and grow. Go and grow. And so I want to just reread to you these five, those five spiritual dangers of not attending church, and maybe we can highlight a couple of them. Number one. You will miss out on God's primary purpose or design for your spiritual growth and well-being. Ladies and gentlemen, the central aspect of corporate worship is the preaching of God's word. The proclamation of scriptures is God's primary means for a disciple of Jesus to grow in spiritual maturity. When a professing Christian misses church, they are missing God's prescribed process for spiritual growth. When you miss going to church because you're going to a ball game or, 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 or you're going to a play or you're having breakfast with your, your, your high school classmates, when you miss being in fellowship and worship with God, you're missing the word of God that God has designed for you that he's given to some preacher, some pastor to preach to you, to teach you. And when you purposely... Uh, and do not attend church, then you're missing God's design for you. Now, this does not uh, uh, mean, ladies and gentlemen, that people with real excuses uh, are, are, are involved in this because there are some people who uh, have to miss church. For example, there are people who have sickness or sickness in the family or they're physically disabled or might have to be out of town to help take care of an elderly parent or some, some real bona fide reason to have to miss church. We're not saying uh, these things should not happen because these things do happen. But we're talking about people who deliberately choose uh, uh, to have a, a meeting with their, their, their friends at McDonald's or, or uh, 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 Seafood Shanty or the uh, IHOP. Uh, at the church hour, or uh, you're, you're going to a ball game, or you're going fishing at the church hour. Ladies and gentlemen, people find all kinds of excuses to do stuff at the church hour. It's a sin to do so. It's a sin. You will miss out on God's, not only is it a sin, but you can miss out on God's primary design or purpose for your spiritual growth and well-being. Number two, when you... Uh, deliberately uh, stop attending church, you disobey God. Listen to this. Corporate worship is not optional for the Christian, meaning worshiping with others is not an option. According to Hebrews 10, 24 and 25, and that was part of our assignment today. And, uh, Another version of, of these verses, and let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as the habit of some is. So at the very least, we have to say that for every Christian, attendance at church gatherings is not an option. The author of Hebrews commands Christians to be present, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves with one another. And I've just shared with you the, the, uh, the church covenant. Uh, churches have covenants, and they all are about the same. We commit, therefore, by the aid of the Holy Spirit to continue meeting together regularly and work together for the continuance of a faithful evangelical ministry in this church as we sustain its worship, ordinances, discipline, and doctrine. And there's even a portion in the covenant where we swear before God that we're going to give to the church for the church's ministry, for the development of the church. How many of you have dropped out in your giving? We don't ask for money in this ministry, but we, are all, we all know that we're to give to the ministry and to promote the ministry that God has put on our hearts. A lot of people, uh, a lot of people throughout America uh, spend more money buying cigarettes than they give to God. They spend more money... On, on their, 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 their wine habit than they do giving to God. Many spend more money on, 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 on makeup and fingernails and getting their hair done than they do uh, uh, giving to God. 
So, so ladies and gentlemen, it's time to bring these things under the, the lordship of Jesus Christ and, and renew that covenant relationship with the Lord, not only with the Lord, but with the church. Many churches are going under because people don't give. And then many churches are going under because they're sitting under leaders who are extravagant and have no concept of, of, of how to handle other people's money and how to spend that money to the glory and honor of God. And if you're in one of those churches, you need to get out. You need to get out. Why do you keep giving your money to a church that is usurping its, its responsibilities and is, is, is squandering the money that people give to the glory and honor of God for the promotion of the gospel and for the work of the church? Number three, when you disassociate yourself from the church, when you stop going to church, stop attending, and that even means when you stop attending the online church, because I know how some of you are. If Pastor Carter says, uh, next week I'm going to preach about homosexuality, and if people have homosexual tendencies, they ain't going to tune in next week. Or next week I'm going to uh, uh, preach on drinking, then those of you who drink, you're not going to come next week. We know how you are, but you need to check yourself and, and, and get under the anointing of the word of God. God sends his word not only for edification, but for correction. The Bible says all scripture is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man or woman of God may be perfectly uh, prepared, properly prepared. Number three, you make a statement to the world. Listen to this. When you stop going to church, the world is watching you. You know, your old homies and roadies, they saw, they saw you when you got saved and you left them and you started going to church. And you, you know, you started going to church, taking your family to church. Now you're not going to church. Those same people are watching you. And, and, and they're saying, they're, they're watching you as you testify to them that God is not even worthy of your praise anymore. This God you boasted about, you bragged about when you first got saved, now you don't even attend church. Those same people who watch you boast about the God who saved you are now watching you boast that God is not even worthy of it anymore. What we spend our time on shows what we truly value. I know this is a good message. I know it's blessing you. If you miss church in order to sleep in or to attend a sporting activity, what does this say about the worth you ascribe to God? Or you just bless God too lazy to get out of bed and go to church? And, and what does this say about the God you serve? Or, or uh, you put uh, uh, your child's soccer game before the Lord, what's this say about uh, the Lord, God Almighty? Or you, you put uh, making, doing overtime on your job before the Lord, what's this say about the God you serve? Replacing your church's regularly scheduled worship time with some other activity demonstrates that God is not even actually worthy of our worship. That's what we're saying to God. Hey, God, you're not worthy of my worship. I mean, I mean I, I'm, a, I, I'm going to my child's soccer game, or I'm going fishing. And you're saying to God, God, you are not worthy. I remember once, one, one Sunday morning, many, many years ago, and Wes, you, you and your sisters and, and your mom and I, and we decided uh, we're going to go to the amusement park on Sunday morning. And we, you all were very excited about going, and, and, and your mom and I, we... We took you all to the amusement park uh, right outside of Philly. We were living in Philly. And when we got there, the amusement park was closed. It was not even open, Wes. And your mom and I looked at each other, and we felt so ashamed of ourselves because the Holy Spirit convicted us. God told me. You should have taken your family to church. The amusement park was closed. And we made a decision that day. We would never, ever, ever again let anything come between us and worshiping God. We were convicted. And you guys were sad. You guys, well, you were just little guys. You wanted to be in the amusement park and all that. 
you were, you were, you're sad, but we were convicted. We were convicted even to the point of being afraid we were going to die that day because we violated God's law and we violated our covenant relationship with God. And we repented, asked God to forgive us. And from that point on, we didn't miss any Sundays in church. Number four, you cannot minister to anyone when you deliberately stay out of church. Listen to this. Too often people think that corporate worship is only about getting their own spiritual needs met. And therefore, if they don't have any spiritual needs at that time, then there's no reason for them to attend. The problem with this view of worship is that it's too individualistic and self-centered. As Christians, our lives are to be spent serving, helping, and encouraging others. Missing church robs you of an opportunity to serve someone other than yourself. Listen to this. I'm going to read that again. Missing church robs you of an opportunity to serve someone other than yourself. If you are going on Sunday morning, you can't offer a word of encouragement to someone who needs it. You can't welcome an unbeliever who doesn't usually come to church. You can't pray with a fellow member who is suffering. You can't encourage the other member with your voice during times of corporate singing. You can't encourage your pastor with your presence while he preaches a sermon he has labored over all week. These are just a few ways you cannot serve if you're absent on Sunday morning. And then the fifth one, we'll, we'll end up with this fifth one, although there are many more on my list, but we end up with this one. You skip out on a foretaste of heaven. Number five, you skip out on a foretaste of heaven. God created us to worship him. That's the primary reason why you and I exist. Psalm 139 verse 14 says, we are fearfully and wonderfully made that we may worship him. Marvelous are thy works, O Lord, and that my soul knoweth right early. God created us to worship him. This is why the church was redeemed. And this is what God's people will do when Jesus returns. When Jesus returns, we're going to be in church all the time. Revelation 22.3 gives us a picture of this. So you might want to read Revelation 22.3. So five reasons, five things that happen when you do not attend church. You'll miss out on God's primary design or purpose for your life. You disobey God. Number three, you make a statement to the world that God is not worthy of your worship. In other words, you diss God. You kick God to the curb. You tell him he doesn't matter. Number four, you can't minister to anyone. Number five, you skip out on a foretaste of heaven. If I were going to continue with this message, I'd say number six, it's a sin when you skip church, when you leave a church and don't find another church. Number six, seven, pride takes over. Stay out of church long enough and you'll be walking in pride and pride comes before the fall. Number eight, it's a sign of self-righteousness. There are a lot of people think they're too, be too much, they're much better than the people in the church and so you don't want to hang around them. But it's your attitude. It's the attitude that stinks. Number nine, it's a sign that you're thinking more highly of yourself than you ought. A lot of people think they're better than everybody else. The scripture warns us against thinking more highly than we ought. Number ten, it's a sign that you're looking down on others. God did not make us to look down on others. Number eleven, when you deliberately skip church, stay out of church, Separation from God is possible. The longer you stay out, the more Satan has time to play with your mind and your heart, the more temptations he'll put in your way, and the more excuses he'll give you for not going to church. Number 12, apostasy is possible. Apostasy is that falling away. When you become apostate, nothing is going to get you back. Ladies and gentlemen, when you become apostate, nothing will get you back. Hebrew, uh, Romans chapter 1 says, God will give you over to a reprobate mind 
If you choose to be apostate, if you choose not to hearken God, you choose to stay away from God, God will give you over to a reprobate mind and nothing can save you. And then the last one, being targeted by Satan. Satan will target you. Once he knows that you've got a problem with the church, once he knows that you're prone to miss church, once he knows that you pick and choose the church you go to or when you go, once Satan sees an opening, he's coming in for the kill, ladies and gentlemen, and he'll use every trick in the book to target you, to keep you away from the fellowship. Ladies and gentlemen, we've got millions of people all over this nation and millions of people in other nations who are broke, busted, and disgusted, who are sad, who are spiritually depraved, who cannot feel the presence of God. Why? Because they made a choice to turn away from God. And there are people who, like Cain, cannot even find a place to repent. And God is still knocking at your door. Jesus, according to Revelation 3.20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and sup with him and he with me. Don't allow yourself to become apostate. Don't allow yourself to drift away or fall away. Tighten up. Tighten up. Do the Archie Bell and the drills. Tighten up. Ooh, tighten up. Tighten up on your life. Tighten up on your relationship with Jesus. Don't let anything separate you from the love of Christ. And remember, remember the church covenant, having been led as we believe by the Spirit of God to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior and on the profession of our faith, having been baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. We do now in the presence of God, angels, and this assembly most solemnly and joyfully enter into covenant with one another as one body in Christ. We engage, therefore, by the aid of the Holy Spirit to walk together in Christian love, to strive for the advancement of this church in knowledge, holiness, etc., etc. Ladies and gentlemen, let's go back to that place where we first committed ourselves to the Lord Jesus and committed ourselves to the church. Remember that covenant relationship. Remember the pledges, the promises we made to God and to our brothers and sisters. And if you find after hearing this message today, should the Holy Spirit convict you that there's, there are areas where you lack, repent. Tell God you're sorry. Ask the Holy Spirit to draw you into the presence of God. Return to God. Return to church. Return to fellowship. Return to sharing the joy of the Lord with one another. Return to teaching your family the ways of the Lord. Father God, we thank you. We bless you. We praise you. Thank you for this message today. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for this message today. Help your people to receive it, God. Forgive us of our sins. Cleanse us of all iniquity. Lord, if there be anyone live or hearing uh, this, this recording who has decided to give their heart to Jesus Christ, help them to confess Jesus as their Lord and to receive him as their Savior and Lord. And if there's anyone who's in a backslidden condition and, and says, I'm tired of backsliding, I want to repent. Help them to repent, turn from backsliding, and return to you. And I thank you that your arms are open wide to receive us all. And we bless you and we thank you. Lord, rebuke the devourer. We cast down all vain imaginations, every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought obedient to Christ. And we thank you, Father. And we bless you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, let the church say amen. Let the church say amen. Amen.